great. Good to have you here. Thank Good you so much. You Even though it's virtually, I hope you will come and visit us someday. I would love to. I wish I it's were there with that. you. Welcome to the PAG webinar. As you know, we keep um, the regular series of webinars more than twice a week deliberately because we want Pakistan to be to listen to what's happening around the world as well as what's happening in Pakistan. Um, PAG is a very old think tank, the Bhatsakhi old think tank in Pakistan, and um, has had excellent relationships with the world over the world. Very good job. And PAG is a leading think tank in Pakistan. Let me, um, so today is a very important seminar. I'm really happy that Professor Jacob Saul has agreed to join us. Professor Saul is a professor of uh, history and accounting at the University of Southern California. And I'm very interested in it, Professor Saul. History and accounting, and we will never allow that because we are too high bound in disciplinary boundaries. But that's a fascinating uh, uh, title. Uh, he's um, uh, educated at in, in, in the University of Iowa in uh, France and in Cambridge. He's a PhD from Cambridge. He's been awarded numerous prizes. Um, and Jacob Barson, uh, that's a serious prize. It's a very good author. I remember him, a Guggenheim Fellowship as well, as well as the MacArthur Fellowship. Oh, wow. wow. The MacArthur Fellowship is it's, it's an amazing fellowship. Where's the soul's book that I read, which excited me to read the book, about the reckoning? The reckoning is a fascinating book, which is not compulsory reading. I'm going to make it compulsory reading. It's a great book to talk about how uh, accountability. We have a lot of conversation here, Professor Saul, on accountability, but not on accounts. And that's something that we have to worry about in the right? So, how do we set up an account for system that uh, affects accountability? And your book gives a very nice history of that. And the book that I want to read is Publishing the Prince, uh, but the Publishing the Prince, which is also, I think, a very interesting book to read. And um, he's a, also the information master, which is another very interesting book. The Reckoning, Financial Accountability and Rights and Formulations, is a great book indeed. Um, so he's going to present us some of his new work, which I'm very excited to hear about. John Bertrand Colbert, we all hear about all the time, and I must confess, I don't know anything more than the few prime minister of the Sun King, I think, or am I wrong? One of the, the French kings. I can never remember the numbers, but Louis the Soto and uh, so the origins of the wealthy ligaments in market building, the example of what beyond the thirties called there. Um, I'm very excited to hear his talk. So, I'm so I'll invite you to take over and tell us the story, which will sound like a fascinating story. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Ilhak. It's an honor um, to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be there um, with you in person. Um, and thanks to um, Professor Zulfikar as well. Well, also, I just wanted to say I admire your institution. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say that in, a, in the Anglo world, and especially in the United States, you can't actually even give a talk about developmental economics unless you're with absolute experts. People really don't know what it is outside of very specialized spheres. So I actually study developmental economics um, in history. And so this is a very unique opportunity for me to at least discuss some of the historical stakes of what I think is the long and remarkable tradition of your institution. So I was very, very excited to receive this, this invitation. And I apologize if I'm a little tired, it's late at night here, um, but I will give it my best. Um, may I share my... Um, my PowerPoint, what I wanted to discuss with you today is um, the example of Jean-Baptiste Colbert in the history of development economics. And what I want to do is I want to um, present some work from my new book, which comes out soon. I worked many, many years on this book, and it is, I would say, uh, a sort of heterodox approach to free market history in which I say, and I will tell you right now, that I don't believe that mercantilism existed 
and I believe that that development economics, as we think about it today, was actually what Europeans were doing in the 16th, 17th, and even 18th centuries. Um, there's an old debate about development economics versus orthodox free market theory, and I'm, I'm sure that you are uh, very much aware of this. And this debate has its origins in the myths of mercantilism and in the idea of economic general equilibrium. And this idea that, that basically economies should just be let free. And I know that for decades and decades and decades, developmental econo economists have shown ways in which models for very advanced countries don't necessarily work, economically advanced countries don't necessarily work for other countries. What I wanna show are the first industrialized nations and what their process of economic development was. I want to, and I think this is very, very important, to do away with the myth of mercantilism, which I think is extremely dangerous um, and, and has just been kind of a long running disaster because it's created a false dichotomy um, between free market thought and supposedly other forms of economics. And what I wanna sort of start by saying is that many so-called thinkers who were supposedly mercantilist from the 17th century I would like to say, without using too much anachronism, that they were pioneering developmental um, economic thinkers, that they thought in terms of economics. And these are two English thinkers from the early 17th century and a French minister from the end of the 17th century. I want to argue that essentially we need to go back and reconsider the entire history of economics to see really what the role of developmental economics were, was, and if free market thought really exists in the way we think it does, or at least in the way that sort of orthodox free market thinkers tell us it does. I'm a specialist in Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis XIV. So he was kind of his prime minister. They say he wasn't, but I've been in his archives. I've spent so many years in these archives, and I've read them over and over and over again. I know them very intimately, and that is helpful. It allows a certain amount of capacity to understand nuance and to understand um, the meaning of what people were trying to say. Colbert, when he arrived in France, France had been shaken by religious war, civil war. It had nearly broken up. The monarchy had nearly fallen. And by the time he comes to power with Louis XIV in 1661, the monarchy is without money, and France's um, manufacturing and commercial base is somewhat destroyed. Um, France really cannot compete with its neighbors, uh, Holland, uh, England, and, uh, and Northern Italy, indeed, and other countries. And France is a kind of uh, uh, rural country with cities that have not lived up to the commercial promise of their neighbors, in great part due to war. And they many of them have been uh, destroyed. For what I want to say here is that to, for so long, in order to understand the history of industrialization, we have studied Britain as the model. I think that has been extremely misleading. There are obvious reasons why we study Britain. Um, they, I mean, I think they also dominated the narrative of economics for a very long time. I think they're going to have a very hard time doing that now. Uh, and I think things are changing. I think Britain is absolutely essential, but I do believe it's one of the only, it's just a piece of the puzzle. I believe that France is in some ways more interesting because it became an industrialized nation more quickly. So Britain developed over a longer period of time in a kind of organic way, which we're still studying. And it is quite remarkable and quite unique. Uh, the Dutch did the same, although they never industrialized in the same way. They became a commercial nation. Um, and Italy also was there the whole time too. Uh, but France did it sort of in spite of its own problems. It was huge. It was impoverished. It had um, a proto-authoritarian monarchy. Uh, it, it had terrible corruption. It did not have great governmental structures, and yet it still succeeds. I find that sort of more remarkable and um, sort of a great example for today. 
if England was a Prometheus, I like to say France was sort of like an atlas holding up absolutism and feudalism. Um, and I think this idea about a great divergence and English exceptionalism is actually really, really uh, historically inaccurate. I do not think that England developed on its own. I believe it not only developed with other European nations, <laughs> which is a topic that is relevant today, but it developed in symbiosis with France, uh, its biggest trading partner, with which it was at war for around 150 years. These wars were actually a kind of a trade conflict, but while they were fighting, they were trading the entire time, which is quite remarkable. Um, Colbert creates a model of market building, uh, of, a, of economic and market building, and he bases it on a remarkable understanding of the need of trust and confidence and what we might even call branding today. His model will actually have more influence on, on countries on the, uh, on the continent as well as the fledgling United States than the British model because Britain was a kind of organic phenomenon. France was actually the product of an economic program. Therefore, it was, very, it was almost impossible to copy Britain. And so most powers are copied France. Um, by the way, there's another myth that France somehow failed. Well, that's absurd. That's a myth that's been going on a long time. Yes, per capita, Britain was more productive. Britain became richer for a time. It also gained massive imperial might. But one of the things that historians have shown is that throughout the 19th century, um, France comes back and often has moments of remarkable wealth. Um, and it and it keeps on par with Britain as far as scientific production goes. And that's something I want to talk about today. There are moments when France pulls ahead of England. And I'm afraid that now, finally, after uh, very long periods of going back and forth, France will truly pull ahead. I do not see with Brexit the possibilities for England have become Brexit is a catastrophe. I mean, I think we're going to find that over the next 20 years unless some kind of possible correction is made. Um, the, the true decline of Britain is upon us, and it will be stark. And in some ways, for those of us who have connections with Britain, um, and whatever these, these uh, mixed feelings we have are, um, it is somewhat tragic. Um, also, a lot of this myth of Britain is based on uh, Weber's idea of the Protestant work ethic. I simply do not buy it. Uh, there were there are groups in Britain who work hard and who are industrious and who invent inventions and make companies. There are others that do not. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Margaret Jacob and Matt Kadan, have done a study of the groups that really did create the Industrial Revolution. There were tiny groups and very specific. It would be very interesting to do a kind of study of non-Protestant people who were at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, and there were many. Uh, I think it's actually quite interesting. And this, these mythologies have, I think, really limited our vision of how economics have worked. Um, and I think people should also be very aware that as much as, for example, I admire Keynes, he was a lousy historian. And he created many of his ideas based on the mythology of mercantilism, that there are these states that are obsessed with bullion, they're not free market states. He was actually a free marketeer. And he uh, sort of, he and others studied liberalism as an opposition to mercantilism. I am going to explain that liberalism grows out of what we might have called mercantilism, but I'm going to call early um, developmental economics. Um, let me just jump ahead here. I don't really want to go into all the, the sort of ins and out of mercantilism. I go into that in my, my book. But what I want to do is, is, is talk about the sort of great myths and great stories we have of Louis XIV's France. France was the most populous nation in Western Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. It should have been the richest nation. Again, it was beset by incredible problems of corruption, war, poverty. I think it's a fantastic example uh, and 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 budding authoritarianism. It's it's a fantastic example for uh, uh, many of our countries today. 
as we all struggle with all of these problems. I'll also add that um, America is struggling now with, with uh, very serious authoritarian movements and also great swaths of the country are not very developed. Now they're more developed perhaps than other parts of the world, but if you look at the poorer states of America, it's quite remarkable how undeveloped they are economically. Uh, and, and the levels of poverty that America has, while not comparable in many ways, are remarkable given its incredible wealth. I live in Los Angeles and we have terrible wealth distribution. We have, there's so much money in the state of California that it's remarkable, and yet we have this terrible poverty. So I think that the story of France is relevant for all countries um, and really, really quite interesting. We have two stories of Colbert. One is that of the mercantilist, um, someone who was obsessed with protectionism, hoarding gold and making war. Um, I can tell you that that having lived in his papers for, I, I actually, now that I'm getting older, I can't even remember how much time I've spent in places or how old I even am. That I guess that's a sign of, of age. I have spent in his papers almost 20 years. Yeah, at least more than 20 years. Um, in just reading over and over again, going through his archives, he mentions the hoarding of gold a few times. It's not significant. He is always opposed to war. War is bad for commerce. He doesn't like war. He thinks it's bad. He thinks defensive war on the seas is necessary due to the aggression of the Dutch and English navies and, and the Spanish and Portuguese navies. But the idea of going to war is always catastrophic in his, in his mind because it will end up stifling development might have been wrong about that but but i think war really meant war on one soil and so he was deeply concerned we have another image of colbert as the patron of the arts and sciences um this is the man who built versailles this is the man who created all the french academies but they're told as completely separate stories and that just startles me so we have one side Colbert, the failed economist. This is the story we hear. I'm looking at books on my shelf right now. One version after the next. And these are really good books and they're wrong. Um, I'm looking at a famous biography of Louis XIV, which, which tells the story of the glory machine of Louis XIV of Versailles and the propaganda. And then of this kind of backwards economic vision of Colbert. It's completely the sort of Anglo-Saxon mythology. So what I want to do is put these two ideas together. Um, many of Colbert's companies indeed failed, um, but many of them did not. <laughs> and Colbert's sugar colonies, for better or for worse, they were brutal slave colonies, succeeded. Um, France creates a large empire. More importantly, I think, France creates a remarkable industrial base under Colbert. Uh, woolen industries, linen industries, uh, um, uh, also glass companies. Uh, uh, porcelain, today Saint-Gobain, in fact, has just been sued in the United States for massive pollution problems. <laughs> but think about how amazing it is that Colbert created a glass company that is being sued right now in the United States for, for pollution. It's still a vibrant, polluting company. Um, uh, I think that's remarkable. So he succeeded in many ways. And, and, and economic historians who have really looked at the details have shown how he did lay the base for later development, which allows France to become the other industrialized nation of the early 19th century. Um, France's colonial companies did not always um, fare well, but his cultural projects are still seen as models. And so I wanna start with this image, which is actually much later, but this is an image that is really of Colbert's pro uh, project. And it is a remarkable, image. And it's one that one would do well to look at. It is a, a kind of idealized version of Colbert building the Royal Library. In the back, we see the library. Theology is the main um, focus. But we see all these different arts and sciences together from genealogy, astronomy, um, uh, uh, engineering, architecture, uh, uh, I mean, we, if you look here, there are all these different, what, what are we call in French, les arts et métiers. So what arts and crafts, which I think in English is, is a derogatory term. In French, it is not. Arts and crafts. So this is basically engineering, industrialization, but also the humanities. Um, uh, uh, philology, poetry, 
rhetoric, all these things are in this picture. And all these industries are here. They're all connected through the library and through his cultural projects. So clearly people in the 18th century and in the 17th century understood Colbert's project better than uh, uh, better than we do now. And I think that's also very, very uh, important. This is a, a kind of famous image of, um, of Colbert showing Louis the opening of the Royal Academy of Sciences. It's never happened. Louis didn't actually go there. Um, but this is Colbert. This is the ideal image. This is a remarkable image because this is propaganda. And it's, and it's in great part true. There, the, here is actually the Royal Observatory, one of the most extraordinary buildings built by Domenico Cassini, who came from Italy to do it and changed his name to Dominique Cassini. Um, and here are all these kind of globe dominating industries or approaches that um, Colbert is showing that the Academy of Sciences will do. What happens is he starts creating a massive propaganda of science and mechanics while also creating these academies, which were real. I mean, France really becomes with England, there are other countries too, but the great centers of new scientific creations. But Colbert does more than that. He is constantly creating images of all these mechanics um, and they are being published. Why? He wants to show the world that France is at the cutting edge, not just of science, but of making things. He brings in foreign scientists, such as Christian Huygens, who he puts in that very royal library, the image of which I showed to you, the idealized image. Huygens is there to symbolize this new success. He's the creator of the pendulum clock. Um, and this pendulum clock becomes one of the most important inventions of the time. And it also becomes absolutely essential, not only to navigation, but to map making. And as we all know, and as Pakistan knows better than perhaps any country in the world, map making has a lot to do with political authority as well as problems, boundaries of countries, who gets what, right? I mean, these are life and death questions uh, where you live. These map making tools were the tools of empire and they would help one claim things, but they would also give one the authority to claim things. And that's what Colbert is doing with all these images. And, and he likes to show these inventions. And then he, with Huygens, they create the measure of longitude. And this allows commercial navigation and geographical definition. And as I say here, power, straight up power. I find it remarkable that the story of, of this, all these scientific things hasn't been sort of shown in this great commercial uh, pro uh, project. Here again is... Um, Louis XIV visiting the Royal uh, Academy and Library, it never happened. But these are these idealized pictures. And now you're looking, not only seeing the, um, the uh, um, observatory in the background, you're seeing all these different inventions. You're seeing the importance of science in a discourse of the legitimacy of Louis XIV's power. And I want you to think about that for a second. Louis XIV's had a legitimacy problem. Um, France had a credibility problem. It was not a respected commercial nation. Science, the new science, um, was also not completely respected. Colbert's genius, and I really do think this is brilliant, and, and he was not a, a wonderful person. He crushed people. He killed printers. He was a really rough guy, okay? So when I say genius, it is not a moral definition, um, uh, and there's a lot of uh, fighting against the concept of genius in the United States. Now, I do think that that we there are brilliant people. What he saw was that if the king gave his authority to science, science could give its authority back to the king. This is an express idea that he has. It is remarkable. And through that, that's not his goal. His actual goal is to build up France as a commercial nation. Therefore, if the king has authority, he becomes more important. He then transfers that authority to science. Science then becomes the basis of trust and France's brand, uh, commercial brand starts growing. Here are again, all these pieces of scientific propaganda. Um, here's the list of academies that Colbert founds personally. It is remarkable. 
and it is the beginning of the country as a modern research institution. Uh, um, other countries had many academies, Italy, Sweden, uh, Portugal, they would have these academies, but Colbert creates them as a part of a centralized state and as part of a commercial project. And I think that is, is completely unique. He begins a project called the Descriptions of the Arts and Crafts, begins in 1666. It becomes the basis for Diderot and D'Alembert's Grand Encyclopedia encyclopedia project the encyclopedia project um and the topics that they study that goes into this new encyclopedia are all these commercial topics and um a famous historian in the united states wrote that the um that in the uh, uh 18th century the encyclopedia turned learning on its head that's partially true, except Colbert did it first with the project. He was trying to put commerce at the same level as formal knowledge, such as theology, philosophy, and other scientific undertakings. Even cheese making, he puts at the level of philosophy and theology. He's trying to turn France into a commercial nation. The idea that he bases this on is having verifiers. France becomes the great country of verifiers. And Colbert is very, very aware that if you have the great linguistic verifier, someone who can master what they would have called oriental languages, um, this, this priest named Mabillon becomes one of the great verifiers of, of Latin. So if the person you turn to as the great authority in Latin, and that's very important in France because that Latin documents from the Middle Ages will be essential to dynastic questions, uh, be essential to, once again, borders, legal questions. If the greatest verifier of medieval documents is working for your state, you have this authority. It also then transfers to commerce because it means that you become this kind of ultimate authority on things. And by the way, he will be very specific about this, this idea of verifying things. Um, he tries he sends out his brother to create a new diplomatic machine based on his other projects. He creates a remarkable diplomatic library. He starts training the first, I would say, centralized large-scale diplomatic corps in Europe using a, an information system based on a library. So it becomes a kind of a, a super reference system filled with lawyers and documents by which everything can be verified. It suddenly means Colbert says over and over again, England and Holland are always beating us by writing treaties, which we sign, which put us at a disadvantage. And this is always happening to developing countries, right? Um, and he feels that France is a developing country. He says, we cannot compete fairly with them. We're not as developed. We are not on the scale. And he says, actually, if he said, we cannot beat Holland. But the problem is, is Holland is coming over our borders and stealing all of our trade, and the borderlands are emptied of industry. What we need to do is compete at least to the level where they can't steal our, 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 our natural goods and our actual our, our skilled labor. And so one of the ways we need to do that is write better treaties. So what happens is before France actually becomes competitive, it's starting to write these remarkable treaties, which will put it on symmetrical footing in trade. I mean, this guy sees trade symmetry as an actual issue that has to be handled at this level in the 1660s. I mean, I think that is just utterly remarkable. Uh, um, he trains his nephew, to become the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and de Torcy really becomes the kind of founder of, um, of European diplomacy and of its methods. Um, and what he starts doing is they start, the French start dominating diplomacy. And I'll add, before I even go on, that when France loses all of its wars, kind of, well, militarily loses the War of Spanish Succession, its diplomats come and actually make it a draw. They don't do so badly. It is a remarkable vision, and it's a, bit, a vision based on developing trade. Um, Versailles is key in all of this. Uh, uh, one of uh, my postdocs here, who is now teaches at the University of Toronto, Jason Nguyen, 
wrote a brilliant PhD about Versailles as an industrial scientific project in which measures and forms and actual techni technical processes were um, created in order to have them be definitive for Europe. So the measurement sticks and actually the pieces of wood and metal and stone that are cut will become the models for building in Europe. And we now know that Europe gets filled with these mini Versailles. Even England starts copying Versailles. It's not just style. It is actual technology. And it's, and it's not just selling luxury. It's actually selling engineering and measurements. It's really a, a brilliant project. And it works. And Versailles economically was seen as a kind of disaster because it cost Louis XIV so much money over time, it might be seen as one of France's greatest assets and, and as one of its most influential things, not for Donald Trump's bathroom um, or for uh, other uh, or for, for Putin's palaces, for, for authoritarian rulers to live in these forms, but actually as a kind of industrial product that is copied and, and exported, which is really remarkable. Um, to fill Versailles, and we already know this, um, Colbert creates all these luxury industries. Uh, he creates uh, the French textile factory of Les Gobelins, creating the most valuable um, tapestries. Um, uh, he also starts, and he does this in tandem with creating, um, this is before India's arrival on the scene with cotton, okay? In the 18th century, France starts becoming dominant in textiles, but also in linen making and in lace. He also does this through fashion. So these things that we think of are, oh, these kind of funny French things. These are wonderful French joie de vivre. No, this is actually a large scale development product based on branding. And, and the in, in, invention of fashion in the 17th century has mostly been sort of handed to Louis XIV as his kind of vision. Colbert was back there the whole time thinking not only is this you know, useful for dominating style, but this is a commercial brand of France. And I, I, this is really incredible. He creates Saint-Gobain, the glassworks in 60, 60, 1665. And with that, he creates the Hall of Mirrors, which is one of the most famous spots in the world. Um, he creates a massive shipbuilding um, series of ports and shipbuilding projects. Some of them are not successful, but Marseille is successful. And it is through Marseille that in the 18th century or from the end of the 17th century onwards, the French will dominate the Mediterranean and Mediterranean trade and put a large footprint in the, the Levant uh, or uh, uh, the Maghreb, North Africa uh, and the Proche Orient. Um, this free port, so Colbert, the absolutist minister, creates a free port uh, in, so this is this hilarious kind of um, paradox of development economics. You have a, a kind of proto, you have an absolutist state creating a complete laissez-faire port. It's, it's very funny, and it's a paradox which a lot of people have a hard time seeing, that this is actually a kind of great moment in laissez-faire economics. He creates a free trade zone, which allows them to dominate the Mediterranean, and he does it with authoritarian politics. Um, lessons for all of us. Um, scientific expertise becomes very important, and what he does is he connects that to commercial expertise. So while they're publishing these books of science, he's publishing books of commercial laws, and the idea is that France is now the one country that's published these these standardized sets of commercial laws. And that gives France great authority. These books become bestsellers around Europe. They're, they're absolutely key. Um, sorry, this is in French. I didn't, I, I, I grew up in France, so I didn't even see that was in French because I don't see the difference between the languages. So basically these are the chapters. They're just all sorts of commercial questions. So if you're a British merchant or an Italian merchant, you're gonna buy this ordinance this set of laws, because it will just allow you to understand commercial laws in general. This is very visionary. Um, some say that Colbert created the Code Noir. He was dead when it was written. The Code Noir is the slavery code. He did not create it. He gave 
general orders to look into it, but Colbert was very ambiguous about slavery because he was obsessed with the idea of high product labor. And he was he loathed um, France's peasant sector. He wanted the French population to be as productive as the English and the Northern Italian and the Dutch who were commercial peoples. So slaves for Colbert, again, his reticence in his letters is remarkable because he doesn't see this as a long-term prospect economically. But this book is really the key book. This book is called The Perfect um, Tradesman, and it is a set of rules, and actually it has a a double entry accounting manual in it. It has all the paperwork and account books necessary to understand trade. It will become the first business manual in Europe, the first international business manual. There are others, obviously, um, it's beginning in the 16th century, but this one is the first one that is created specifically to be an overall business manual for Europe. And it succeeds and um. Uh, uh, there's a sort of second edition that becomes a dictionary, and then this becomes the English um, Dictionary of Commerce. So the French actually create the Dictionary of Commerce and of some industry for the English. And this is an amazing move by Colbert because, no, France is not as good as England in trade and industry, and yet the English are using their manual. So many in England think France is much more of a threat than it is, which is precisely what Colbert wants them to think. And what does it do? It ups their brand. It's a brilliant, brilliant move. He sponsors accounting manuals. France is super backwards in accounting. England is the most advanced accounting, double entry accounting uh, uh, nation at the time. He sponsors commercial literacy through mathematics. He wants applied mathematics. He says, our merchants are lazy, dishonest, and illiterate. I mean, he says he loathes the French merchants. He wants to crush them and create a better merchant class. It doesn't always work, but it is a remarkable vision. It's often very funny to read him talking about the French merchants. He just thinks they're not good enough, but he doesn't want people to necessarily know that. So he's creating these a kind of, you know, the, the propaganda on one side and the other side, he's trying to educate his merchant class, um, not always successfully. Um, so France becomes this depot of industrial knowledge. The English fear the French. Um, and what Colbert does is while he's doing this, he starts building up industrial knowledge and he starts building French industries and they are infant industries. He knows that he is not only using protectionism, he is using, um, incentives. He's using monopolies and what he says, and this is the thing that I make clear in my book over and over again in his writings. He said, the liberty of commerce is almost always preferable to the opposite. However, you cannot have it unless you have, and this is the exact word that he uses, but an equality of trade, a symmetry of trade. It's quite remarkable. I have to say it's quite uh, ahead of its time. Um, and so in the end, Colbert creates long-term traditions of measurement. He creates a brand, which today France is still um, uh, uh, considered and is the center of the luxury industry. And I find that to be unbelievable. If you consider that a country creates in the 1660s, a major national industry, and today it is still, and this is not necessarily an advantage for the French, French today, because their scientific, um, uh, 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 the scientific, uh, and research part of France is not as strong as it should be at all. But France still has this brand. People still trust France because you can get the finest food and these perfumes and these bags. But as one industrialist said, does France want to be the country known for its handbags where other countries are known for their you know, artificial intelligence? That could be a disadvantage now. But France still has enormous credit for this. Um, France. Colbert creates a development model based on all these sophisticated, specific strategies, and many of them work. And the one thing that I think is remarkable in all this is the role of science. And Colbert invests first in science. He invests in industry too, but it's just sort of remarkable to see how key he thinks science is at the beginning 
of a move to develop one's economy. And that would mean a whole new strategy um, to develop a nation, one which China, for example, has used. I mean, I really like to think of China as a parallel to France, except people don't necessarily trust Chinese products. Um, I, I've worked in parts of Asia and I say, would you drink milk from mainland China? And everyone laughs. Do you want a job in mainland China? Yes, they want the money, but they don't want to drink their milk. I think that remains a big challenge for China. But anyway, this is this is my my hypothesis. This is my new the kind of core of my new book, um, and it puts Colbert as someone who says, "I want free trade, but it has to be a developed free trade." And I think it's remarkable and pioneering. And I do think there are lessons, even though it is so far in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Sol. That was that was very good indeed. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Sol. That was very good indeed. Um, put a lot of things in perspective, and it's it's very interesting to see that even then, activist policy and far-reaching policy worked, and that Colbert's um, the trust of his policies, as you said, were trust plus credit um, plus. Uh, he worked on um, building up academic research, which is far-sighted because we don't do that even today. And he worked on building a, a brand name as well as local uh, industrial strategies that were based both on protectionism as well as free trade, and probably set up the first uh, free trade zone in the world, or what what would you call it? A pre preceded even Hong Kong. So that's uh, that's quite fascinating. But let me try and put a question to you and urge everybody to raise their hands who want to get into the discussion. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what, what ramifications do you think this has for a country like Pakistan today or in a standard African country? Um, how can we learn from Colbert and move, move forward? We've also built many palaces, many beautiful things, but never achieved the same thing that Versailles did. We protected our industry enormously. We have built universities galore. We, we have built 250 universities in Pakistan and are building more, but we've achieved nothing. We even built an academy of sciences. So where are we wrong and where did Colbert succeed? Please go ahead. I, I mean, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> I mean, as this is the question. I've been thinking about it for the past few weeks. Um, and I've been thinking about Pakistan, and I know Pakistan's economic and political history. Um, and I'll remember, I mean, first of all, there is a difference in that um, the subcontinent had was was pillaged by Britain. So that's that's a difference. France had been destroyed by war and 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 uh, uh, civil war, but it had not been pillaged by other countries. The wealth, and I really do mean this, we're now seeing the studies of what was taken from, and I, I use this word, I use this word technically, of the greater Indian uh, area. I mean, it was just, Britain just took everything it possibly could, a huge amount. I mean, we're, we're now even thinking that the wealth of the, the, the British empire was actually the money from the Raj, straight up, nothing more, <laughs> which is why England ends up not looking so wealthy when colonialism ends, right? I mean, by the end of the war, Britain is not in great economic shape. But lessons for Pakistan, and I've been thinking about that, and I and I was reading up on Pakistan, um, you know, after the nation was founded, and and it, you know, with vast resources that it had, and you know what Colbert did, and. I don't think that a place like Pakistan thought this way. And Pakistan, as a developing nation, was still shedding its brains to places like Britain, right? Um, what I was thinking about this this afternoon. The first thing we learned from this that should have been done was to pay whatever it cost to put the best brains of Pakistan in Pakistan and bring the best foreign brains to just create one institute that's the best institute in the world and just put it there at a vast cost and really also political cost because when you try and do this people say why are they getting all the money this always happens when you have a well-funded public university right 
Um, I mean, the history of your own institution kind of tried and, and succeeded to do what I'm talking about, right? I mean, you have an international reputation. You had foreign big names and important people. So you have at a certain scale been able to kind of do that, but it's obviously been a struggle, right? So that I think that for me is if you look back and if you're sitting at the beginning of Pakistan's nationhood and you've studied Colbert, which we had not had this information before, and you say, look, we are starting, we've been pillaged, what do we do? The first thing I think would have been to get the brains because Pakistan always had the brains, right? And they've got, and a lot of them went to Britain. Get them back here with foreign brains, show that we can take all sorts of brains and make us a world-renowned center that builds credit, that builds brand, that builds actual traffic through the country. Again, this is something that your own institute has done at a small level. You have an international reputation. By the way, that's really important. That's why I'm excited to speak with you. So, but anyway, that's just one lesson, but I thought about it a lot. And I thought, you know, um, after partition, what would have been the great move, right? And I, and I said, this is a move that, that no one really thought about it. The other problem is, of course, the elites of the Raj were going to Oxford and Cambridge and to London and to Leeds and these other places. That should have been my sense. Anyway, that's that's just one idea, and I'm sure you can argue it out with me, but it's a hypothesis that I have. No, I think that's, that's fascinating, but um, let me also say this, Jacob. Um, let, let me do a little counterfactual with you. I, what, I, what you said, I think I take very... Uh, very well. I think it's a, a very good idea. But let me also put this to you, uh, which is a fascinating thought, that if I bring Colbert and France of that time to today, uh, because I think in one sense, maybe Colbert also benefited from, from the fact that he could be original at that time. Today, what is the scope of a country like Pakistan being original? Because try and think, we have a huge paraphernalia of international law, as you pointed out that the treaties were written against France and he built a huge expertise on writing treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have a huge paraphernalia of international law that is coming out of the UN, the World Bank, the IMF and many other agencies, and they're well funded by the West, and as well as another thing, which is called technical assistance. We are told we don't have to think. We just copy the West of the past and all these consultants will come and tell us what to do. And uh, yeah. fine, we just have to read the manual and move no. on. No, 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 no. Would Colbert have uh, succeeded in that milieu? Well, Colbert actually went to, he sent his sons and his brothers to all the industrial countries to steal their models. <laughs> he was really into industrial and model espionage. Um, so that was, but he absolutely knew that France had to ha create its own model and that it was very, very specific place. Um, um, and he actually, I mean, look, France was a leading country throughout the Middle Ages in Europe. But I mean, I looked at Pakistan in the 50s. I think, I mean, You've thrown out a lot of things at me. One of the first things is many of those institutions that you're discussing will come and tell a country like Pakistan to open up its borders to trade when it's not ready to. And that has been the IMF's move for years. The IMF has gotten gotten better, but boy, it used to be a disaster. I mean, you know, it was just gutting, gutting developing countries. Now I think it's actually become smarter and better. And I know good people that work there that know this. We we know this. Um, sending in consultants is a disastrous thing. You need your own experts and right. They need their own culture of expertise. And that comes from a mix of ones of, of leading countries. So the French look at the Dutch and the English and the Italians and they bring them there, but they, they really do then insist on creating their own styles, their own methods from their past. So, I, boy, sorry, I'm starting to sound like a nationalist. And I think I am a, a nationalist in the sense of valuing the wealth of one's culture and also one's, the sort of common sense of a country who say, look, you can do that there, but if you try this here, you're going to kill large swaths of the population. I mean, if you build that dam, it will not work. It will be disastrous. 
So I do think that has been foreign aid in all of its ramifications have been, you know, there. it's a neo-colonial thing in many, many ways and has impoverished countries. Um, so I think it's highly problematic. So I guess, ah, I, I really, I'm opposed to nationalism, but I'm for development. I, I still believe in a kind of national development strategy for a country. Does that make, I'm, I'm, for, I'm for international trade and, and all these things, but I do think countries have to protect their, their, their strengths. I, I don't want to use a more nationalistic language because I, I feel I'm veering into that, but I'm not a nationalist. Anyway, does that make sense? Is that a, is, does that answer? I mean, I think. Fair point, fair point. Fair point. Uh, Mandur Ahmed Sab. I, uh, okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, uh, two questions. One is uh, the, the, just the comment you made about IMF asking countries to open up. And uh, you, know, you are kind of critical of that. But the countries who did so, like uh, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, et cetera, who opened up earlier, have been much better off compared to countries like Pakistan, who just kept themselves protected. Even today, their auto industry, they started making autos from 1950 but it's an infant industry until today because it's highly protected, so it stays an infant industry. If, if you would love me for a second question, uh, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. My, my second question is, if I understood you correctly about Colbert, you, you said he was uh, not, it was a myth of calling him a mercantilist, I, I, I think so. But we, I mean, I, I, I've been in trade for many years and my last assignment was Pakistan's ambassador to WTO. And we were always, whoever, you know, spoke about uh, history, this is the first time I'm hearing something different, but we were always told that, you know, he kind of was a great protectionist and, uh, you know, all those things uh, promoted uh, exports and restricted imports and all that thing. But you are saying that now it's all a myth. And in fact, he was not that uh, mercantilist. And, I, I, and my link question is, how do you compare his philosophy with Adam Smith? Um, I'm not an economist, but- Okay, uh, I just wrote a book about this after eight years of study, but let me just answer the first question. Um, you have to understand, I mean, I, I first of all, Singapore is very specific, tiny place. And it has a founder who, after the you know the end of uh, 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 British imperial rule, and after partition, because this is a country which which uh, has um, connections with uh, strong connections and is strongly influenced. And the founder of Taiwan was, I mean, of, of Singapore is very very concerned about what happened um, in partition um, and and the strife, and that's. The, the 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 anti-racist laws in 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 uh, Singapore created from that. He creates a remarkable country that is also very opportunistic and small. And one of the first things that he does is starts this incredible interaction between foreign and local um, foreign and local uh, 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 universities. And he does not. And you're you're right about this. He does not. Um, have, I would say, a colonial hangup of getting rid of all the British institutions. He uses them where he finds it useful. But the state has a heavy hand in Singapore. Singapore is not always just open trade. The state is always working. The, the state companies still work. They're still the biggest companies there. So it's very, very hard to call that a, a completely liberal country when Temasek still runs all these different companies. And of course, the number one airline in the world year after year, Singapore Airlines is, is owned by the state. I mean, so you have state companies, that's very Colbertist. That's the first thing um, on that. Um, Taiwan also is a protectorate of the United States in many ways. It is given massive um, advantages by the United States. Um, and Taiwan does develop quite remarkably with the help of the United States and also the rebuilding of Japan after the war. So Japan being a major industrialized nation working in tandem with a Marshall Fund situation and Taiwan benefiting from that. I think that's very, very hard to compare um, Pakistan 
to uh, those countries that um, become kind of recreated by the United States. And also remember countries built on the Marshall Fund and, and Taiwan does benefit from that enormously as very connected to um, uh, uh, Japan, but also still connected to also Hong Kong. Uh, it's it, Those are very, very complex, specific examples. I spent a lot of time in those countries. I know them well. Um, I don't think it's as simple as them just opening up. Protectionism can be utterly destructive. It has to be strategic. Colbert, yes, it is an absolute myth that all he was doing was doing protectionism. He was very pointed. He demanded that the wool trade open up in England. He wanted them to open up because the French would have flooded England with wool. Well, what do you think the English do? In 1651, they create the, uh, the, um, the navigation laws, which are protectionist laws, which Colbert then copies. So Colbert's model comes from England first. And he says, and, and in 1660, they redo the laws. By the way, I'm lecturing on this tomorrow to my undergraduates. Um, and so England creates all these protectionist laws and Colbert says, exactly, you're pre creating protectionist laws. We're gonna create protectionist laws, but why don't we get to a point where we can negotiate to open these laws up? The English don't want to. They argue about this throughout the 18th century. And over and over again, the experts like Defoe say, look, if we open up to the French, they will destroy our wool market. It will be over for us. Um, so Colbert is much more sophisticated than that. Over and over again, he says, what I want to do is get a symmetrical moment and have the market open through a treaty. That's what he says. And there, I, I mean, I can pull the books down off my shelf and read from them. Yes, it is a, a mythology, a mythology which was quite badly done and easily accepted. Now that takes us to your question about Adam Smith. Well, Smith thought two things about Colbert. In fact, Smith, who I think we should, Colbert ran France and created its industrial, scientific, and cultural base. Smith was a professor of um, moral philosophy at Edinburgh who lived with his mother most of the time. Um, he also helped James Watt find an office. The, the Industrial Revolution was going on around Smith and he never mentions it, except with his point about nails. He misses the Industrial Revolution to some extent. Even with his division of labor, he does not see. He calls for an agrarian revolution, essentially, a return to agrarian authority in, um, in Britain. Very, very clearly, uh, you just have to read his book over and over again. He talks about the importance of agriculture and all wealth coming from agriculture. It's as if you wrote a book about economics today in Silicon Valley and you didn't talk about programming or applications or something like that. It's quite remarkable. Smith, however, I do think is very smart on Colbert. Um, what did he know about Colbert? Not very much. Um, all he had were the laws. He didn't have any trade information. He had no statistics. He didn't read statistics. His library is mostly moral philosophy. So to take him as an authority on trade would be a great, great error. By the way, Smith warned against the dangers of companies and businessmen and lauded oligarchic landowners as the real people who should lead an economy. All you have to do is read The Wealth of Nations. He says this. Most people have not read the 1,200 pages of The Wealth of Nations, which I have read 30 times over and over and over again. They're there. I recommend that you read them again carefully um, to see what's actually in there. He says two things about Colbert. One is that he put too many regulations on his own industry. That is definitely possibly true. Um, and there are complaints by, by French merchants about this, but he also, those regulations also had to do with weights and measures and stamps. And those stamps were quality stamps. And those stamps were at the basis of the success of the wool trade. So Smith is partially right um, that Colbert did not trust his own manufacturers to do their own quality control, but Smith wasn't aware of the extent of the poor quality of French textiles and that Colbert was trying to pull it up. And the recent studies have shown that it's a mixed bag and one called one historian who I think is really the best on this called it a mediocre success, <laughs> which, I, which is still a success. He also said Colbert was an incredible visionary in his use of information in organizing a state. 
And that's quite remarkable. He does not condemn Colbert. He condemns Louis XIV. Louis XIV is the villain of the wealth of nations. Colbert is actually this kind of other important figure who he clearly thinks is worth studying and emulating. That's one of the reasons I studied Colbert is because of what Adam Smith said about him. So I think it's very, very important um, to go back and to look at the evidence. And one thing I would recommend is going back and rereading The Wealth of Nations, although it's going to be a slog. It's 1,200 pages, and a lot of it will seem incomprehensible to you. Right. It is. Indeed, it is. Indeed, it is. Shahid, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, thank you, Jacob. That's a fascinating talk uh and always uh always fascinating and always interesting to listen to somebody who with a talk on economic history uh being one of uh, the students or rather having a bit of interest in it so that's a uh, out of this fascinating talk and a few questions that were asked by uh, my colleagues and dr nadeem uh sorry uh, there's a shahid mahmood i'm research fellow at white so i have two questions uh from your uh, very nice talk uh you uh, Dr. Nadeem asked a question about uh, outsiders or uh, what we uh, normally call uh, consultants coming in and dictating how economic policy should be made and how it should be done. So the question is uh, about intellectual capital uh, of a country. How important is it to protect the intellectual cap capital of a country so that nobody from outside can come and uh, dictate terms to you? And the second one, uh, it's an interesting one. You mentioned something about brands and some of the brands that uh, Colbert uh, built and that have persisted over time. So in a broader sense, my question is, uh, it comes down to what's the government's role in uh, uh, building these kind of successful brands or, or, and uh, successful economic management, if you may. Right, these are very good questions. And they're, they're linked to the question we just had. I, by the way, I just wanted to go back really quickly to talk about the, the, the disaster of, of clearly Pakistan's car industry. I mean, this the problem is, is that is that the fault of protectionism or is it bad industrial application? Because Singapore is, what Singapore did was Singapore would often bring in foreigners to work with local people to create industries. One of the things I think that could help answer the question about the cars, and this, uh, Shahid goes into your, um, this goes into your um, question. Look at the history, and I have not looked at this, and I should. I'm fascinated by Singapore Airways. I'm really fascinated that the best, there are other airlines which compete and whatever, but that the best all-around airline in the world is state-owned, okay? Um, and that they're constantly changing, and I've taken it, and I've examined it, and I'm, I find it quite remarkable. Um, take that and compare it to the car, the history of the car industry in Pakistan. I wonder what that would look like as a, as a case, as a, as a case comparison. Um, and can you, you know, is it possible to do given that Pakistan has this vast, huge history, it's a massive country and, you know, uh, uh, Singapore is the size of my neighborhood in Los Angeles. You know, I mean, we're talking scale is always really, really important here. Um, sorry. Now, the idea of bringing in outside expertise, I, I, you know, I, it's very, very hard to answer these questions without specifics. My grandfather's cousin, Martin, was one of the economic advisors to the Americans, more or less forcing reforms onto the Japanese after the war. But cousin Martin really admired Japan, and he worked very carefully in his personal letters, which we have, and his he wrote a kind of autobiography, which we have, but he also, um, when he retired, some of this was published by his colleagues. He talked about being very careful to guard many of the Japanese practices and to respect them while they were giving economic advice. So the, I think the question is, and it's quite remarkable to see that, and that, that was quite an extraordinary success, but it was building obviously on a country that had had a remarkable industrial, uh, remarkable and troubling industrial history because it was so connected to war. Um, uh, so I think these things are very, very particular, right? Um, what I don't, what I do think is very dangerous are, are I, I really say this with experience, are certain management consulting companies that come in that are hired by governments and are 
they are they do not have the kind of disinterestedness that my grandfather's cousin did in a true belief of helping other countries prosper and sharing knowledge rather than forcing knowledge. A lot of these companies are looking to pillage or to get quick returns. So I do think the way one does it is very important, the relationship, the level of understanding. My grandfather's cousin was married to a Japanese woman. I mean, these are really, these are questions which really interest me. How do you do this stuff? You guys are asking these incredibly hard questions which have been in my family for a very, very long time. And that's clearly why I'm struggling with them. It's not out of the blue that I'm coming to you with these with these issues. Um, I, the other thing is I do think it's often very, very hard to take a model that's worked somewhere else, especially your country has an incredibly long history and it has lots of spheres and structures which are very, very ancient. They will not disappear overnight. And in some ways, Singapore, for example, was a tiny revolutionary country in which they wiped away ex existing class structures and they created something from partial scratch. It's very hard. I don't know if that answers your question. I So I think that protectionism can be a disaster. It has to be done, I believe, in competition. I'm against monopolies, but infant industries, and then I say infant, right? That's very important. Let me ask this, though, just a return question. What would be, I'm really interested in this, what do you at your school, with all your wisdom, think that the best possibility would be for the car industry in Pakistan? That that interests me a lot because I think that's a hard question. What would work best? Would it be best to let Renault come in? I don't think so. Their technology, their cars aren't that great. Um, um, would it be good to consult with the best car makers and make a partnership? Um, what would they ask in return? The Germans like to walk away with everything. I can tell you that from working with them in Greece, that they don't like to give much away at all. So that could be problematic. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, what, what do you think? I think to answer your question, Jacob, I think quite frankly, what you said earlier was very interesting. You said that Colbert in a sense created, or have we lost, oh, it's Colbert in a sense created science to help the king and for science to in, in turn legitimize the king. I don't think we've got that kind of a cycle going in Pakistan, unfortunately, or in any developing country for that matter, because either because of colonialism or the international um, uh, architecture that's come up now, we have ceded in terms of intellectual development to the West. We think that all innovation, all science, all even um, soft science, even social science has to come from the West. We don't have the verifiers that you are talking about. And I think those verifiers, please very, very sort of clarify the concept, what you mean by verifiers too. But I think what Colbert did, and which I would like you to contrast with China, because in a sense, China is also doing the same thing. China is very clearly trying to, to take on the, U, the, the West in terms of intellectual development by fighting for patents, by fighting for science, even going to space, et cetera. So China is actually carving out a scientific um, proposition. Not so much the other countries, but China is doing it very hard. And India tried in the time of Nehru, but has not given up. India is now going much more in the direction of... Uh, of the world. So in, in terms of the car industry, I'd say we don't... My, my philosophy is... I'm sorry, let me step back a little. My feeling is that industry, we should think of industry very differently. We think of industry as men with machines. People import machines and then they run the machines. I think we have to think of industry much more as product development and as um, you know, um, product developers, so to speak. So the, we, 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 uh, we, we have to do our own research. My favorite uh, saying on this is that the Apple, tele Apple company, which, which is the largest company in the world, which has eight times Pakistan GDP, but Apple um, produces nothing. Everything is produced in China. But Apple has, a, which are your neighbors in California, Apple has, a, has a, the largest R&D uh, set up in the world. So I think the biggest lesson that I draw is we don't have R&D at all. And uh, so I don't know, would you like to react to that? Um, yeah, so there was a lot there. Um, and you got me thinking about a whole bunch of things. I mean, I mean, just go back. 
Well, one of the arguments we're having now, though, is that we have the R&D here, but remember that the center of the United States, our industrial base has been gutted, and we have social, near social unrest, and I would say the, the, the real risk of civil strife in the United States because of deindustrialization. Um, I've worked with developmental economists who have convinced me that keeping high-tech manufacturing on your soil allows you to do the on-site R&D to scale up and create um, to create manufacturing that that has value added in constant growth. China really took a lot of that and then learned a lot of technology from manufacturing. That was a strategic error. Now that's an argument. We had that argument actually with Larry Summers and with uh, Gordon Brown and with uh, Lord Sainsbury and with the development economist Eric Reinert at my university during COVID. And there was real disagreement on that. I still, Summers believe that you take the, the, the manufacturing, you give it away. I'm convinced that when it's high tech manufacturing, uh, you don't want to do that. Um, I just, I, I don't know if this is an uncomfortable topic, but I mean, Pakistan has created nuclear weapons. That gives it some authority. I mean, that not everyone can do that. So um, that's both very problematic and scary. I don't like nuclear weapons. I don't think they're a good thing. Um, at the same time, Pakistan did come to a certain point of having a level of expertise. I know this sounds extremely cynical. And thinking like Colbert here, I do not think cap Pakistan capitalized on that. It was done in the wrong way, often for the wrong reasons. But it was an opportunity that possibly was missed. If you can do that at the time that Pakistan did it, frankly, you could have the country could have done other things. I don't know if that's a taboo to talk about, but it's something that's been on my mind as well. Um, and that, you know, that still leaves us with the question of the car industry, and it leaves us with the question of China. Um, China is making quantum leaps in research and development, but my father is a molecular geneticist and a creator of vaccines. He said he, he trained 110 Chinese scientists who could have created a vaccine, and they did not, using the technology of the kind of genetic engineering that my father's an expert in. He said China's failure was quite remarkable, and, and actually revelatory of the problems. Now, those problems might be ever overcome. He does not think that the kind of science he does can function well in an authoritarian bureaucracy. He might be wrong. He might be wrong. Um, we'll see what happens. So China's also now going more to an authoritarian way. Will it be able to prosper that way? Will its science be able to prosper? Um, in some ways, obviously, it's prospering. In other ways, we don't know. And I think that remains an open question. Um, I don't know if those, I mean, I don't have, you know, complete answers for all these Fair questions. Point. Nobody, I don't think anybody has complete answers. Manzoor Ali Sran Saab, last question. Thank you very much. Very much uh, enlightening uh, lecture. I'm from uh, Karachi teaching in a service. So we were shared the link to attend uh, your, uh, this is a webinar, and I appreciate your efforts of uh, Dr. Nadi Always, I listen to your spaces as well on a Twitter. So my uh, question is: ke, uh, Jacob talked about uh, nationalistic, mercantilist uh, approach uh, France adopted earlier as a project of a national development, focusing on science as a tool of uh, innovation, as a tool of uh, commercialization. And then we saw this nationalistic uh, approach uh, after World War II. You talked about uh, Singapore, you talked That's about okay. South Korea. They, they adopted this uh, nationalistic uh, project focusing uh, on uh, local development. They adopted the uh, protective measures. Even uh, uh, if you read uh, Raghi, he, uh, USA allowed uh, what they call uh, embedded uh, liberalism. They, uh, they they provided a uh, lot of assistance to uh, Japan, but at the same time, they allowed Japan to be a protective to uh, protect its uh, local industry, but on a competitive basis. 
so with regard to the pakistan pakistan last uh, you know those opportunities pakistan got in this uh, you know ke world war 2 era where there was a competition between the capitalism and the communism and most of the these are developing countries getting a soft flows of aid and they prioritized they invested in the infrastructure health education industrial infrastructure and today we see the south korean company in singapore i read the second largest in the economy but now we are in a different era ke we are in a post washington consensus era we have a imf mandu sahab jaldi mandu sahab zara jaldi kar le question ji sir main jaldi so we 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 have a imf we have a wto forcing countries to adopt a liberalization uh can you see any chance for a pakistan to grow and develop in this age of liberalization privatization deregulation when pakistan's local industry is not that much competitive okay. and further Okay. In a development, Great. we have to identify the actor, as we talked about at that time. Louis. Thick. Thick. Question. Question has been noted. Let Let uh, uh, Jacob answer that. Go ahead, sir. I mean, well, first of all, you say that it's a period of deregulation and liberalism. I mean, I don't actually see it that way. And also, I mean, this gets back to the question of uh, closed markets. I mean, come on, China has kept its markets, controlled its markets incredibly, right? It decides when it lets which car company in. It decides which cars are going to be sold. At the same time, it's attracting factories from Lexus, trying to beat Taiwan out for Lexus factories, which it did recently to the dismay of some of my friends in Taiwan. I mean, they've been incredibly aggressive. So if we're going to attack protectionism in general, I don't know where that leaves us with the Chinese model, which is really predatory protectionist model, not unlike Colbert's, right? They've, it really looks like a Colbertist model. And remember this, and I start my book with this quote, at the very moment the United States, you know, po- all the politicians in the United States were calling for international tariffs, you had Xi Jinping in his earlier iteration saying china is for free trade <laughs> it's for international free trade but there's not free trade in china there are there are pockets of free trade but things are very very controlled the question i think and i think i made this out and what you're what, what you talked about made me think about for pakistan is how does pakistan now at a disadvantage in this i mean this is what stands out to me and i don't want to be I don't want to, you know, be harsh, but how does a country that has been trying to develop so long and has had so many both opportunities and advantages? I mean, Pakistan is huge, it had certain grand natural resources and it has a huge brain trust, which we see here today in our discussion. I mean, this is, you know, uh, no one can deny that Pakistan has all of these remarkable wealth and assets. Here we are at a moment though where wealth is being decided in partially by natural resources but that doesn't work look at russia right it's being decided by technology in great great part as we have pointed out can a country like pakistan come back and have a place in this well india does india is a great startup nation and there's technology everywhere i think that that there is a capacity for this and this does take a kind of entrepreneurial openness but it also takes at the same time educating large swaths of people keeping them in pakistan and creating zones where these freedoms can also be protected it's super complicated i don't see a single model but how does pakistan thrive in an age where we need different kinds of technologies whether they be communicative or green or ai or inter- interchangeable i think that pakistan has possibilities for this um how does it get there i don't know i don't know is this does is this is the state in a can the pakistani state with all of its ch- challenges lead this or would it be better to create a free trade zone in a city for startups and make it a startup center i mean i think that i mean these are hard questions i i don't i don't know but i think that those are the kind of things that come to mind for me 
that's how one thinks about it. Um, is it is it useful to have a car industry at this point for Pakistan? I don't even know. I don't know. This is very, very hard. I do know that every time I pick up a phone in the United States to get technological help, it's coming from India. I don't know if people are in Pakistan or in Bangladesh who I'm talking to. I, I think there are some people in Bangladesh. I don't know if Pakistan's on there. But I know that lots of low-level tech jobs, which are growing, are coming out of the subcontinent. Um, I know that that is a growing industry. And I know that there's a lot of possibility there. Um, I don't know the situation of Pakistan on the ground for possibility. So all I'm doing is kind of thinking out loud. I'm Fair curious enough. to hear what you think about that too. I mean, where do you think Pakistan, how will Pakistan deal with, for example, the technological economy and how does it relate, for example, to the explosion of that economy and programming, for example, in India. Fair enough. And Jacob, let me let me to answer that. Let me just kind of draw a broad synthesis of your work, the Jacob Sol work, of the Hariri work, of the North End Asimogna Robinson work. All these things, when I read them, and I'm not a big scholar like you, I just read these things occasionally and casually. What I get out of all this is that. The global race is all about intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. And whoever gets the intellectual capital, whether it's in the form of institutional development, innovation in the institutional development, innovation in legal framework, innovation technology, whatever, gets the prize. And in some sense, you said the same thing that France tried to catch up with the advantage that England had. But I think somewhere along the line, and you can answer this better, uh, that somewhere along the line, France did not make the same strides in basic sciences as England and others did. And later, England lost that advantage to the US, and um, China is trying to gain that advantage. And really, it's an intellectual race. And we, people in this part of the world, we, the darkies of the South, we are not even in the race. We don't even want to be in the race because quite frankly, we've ceded the race to the institution that the West has created, mm -hmm. that those institutions will guide us in the future. They will tell us how to live, how to, how to do everything. So quite frankly, the Oriental Orientalist mission mm -hmm. continues that mm -hmm. the natives where we live are to be civilized by the West. And we have willingly submitted ourselves to be civilized. So quite frankly, those who are being civilized can never catch up in the global race unless we change our mindset. And ready, right now, I can tell you, there is no ground swell anywhere in Pakistan or the Middle East or even uh, Africa. Uh, India is probably somewhat of trying, somewhat of uh, making some, but India is not trying to make the institutional innovation. Right. India is trying to keep the same thing, keep the same institutions but try and develop over them. And in fact, going towards fascism. So I don't think I'd be very- Absolutely. Scared. Absolutely. My so, God. So that's my synthesis. <laughs> React to it, please. I could not agree with you more. I, 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 I could not agree with you more. Um, <laughs> you summed it up in, with, in terrifying succinctness. By the way, we will take your brains. I mean- <laughs> oh, our great threat now, and I will say this, is the growing fascism in the United States. For the first time, we, um, the philosophy department where I teach is one of the best philosophy departments in the country. We had a top uh, philosopher and she returned to Australia. And, and we had another top philosopher return to New Zealand. I think it was because of the growing fear of what was happening in the United States. For the first time, I'm seeing us lose brains. I do not think it would have been, we ha we got them and some of them are leaving for the first time. Now, interestingly enough, my uni our economics department has all these top French economists. How startling that one of the fields that France really actually is leading in, some of their top people are here at my university in Los Angeles. That is a terrible sign, yeah. okay? That is a terrible sign for France. Um, uh, I listen, I mean, all you have to do is go around the Los Angeles area and you will find leading Pakistani minds. You will find them all over the place. We will take your brains. I don't know how long we can continue doing that. Um, 
but the appeal is still, it still is quite remarkable we can offer people compared to even France. I think England is is going to be in deep trouble outside of um, the European Union. And I do not think they have their whole, their whole success had been to be this sort of small to medium country with one of the best scientific um, uh, 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 institutional, you know, with, with some of the best scientific institutions of anyone in that class. And, and Brexit was a suicide act. By the way, th those are people who are coming here are like British people, <laughs> you know, as lots of Europeans go back to the continent, I think Germany will profit from this. Um, Actually, we're even seeing Spain profit because many Spanish scientists I know from molecular biology are returning to um, are returning to Spain. I don't know. I mean, I I fear what you say is right, and uh, um, I didn't want to say that because it's it's pessimistic. But yeah, and and I what what can I say? Um, Neo colonialism in its new form is is. A, a remarkably violent and sophisticated form of extraction because rather than things, it is brains. Exactly. And, and the problem I, is that we have submitted to it. No, so I, we are not even fighting for it. We are submitted. So, I, so there I, it is. That's the story of humanity. What can we do? That, uh, that was the thesis of my talk. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll keep calling on you. Please keep helping us grow. You really made a difference. I've learned a lot today. Thank you very much. I did too. It was a real honor. I, I hope we can keep speaking together, really. I would love Thank to continue much. this conversation. Thank Inshallah you. Thank you. Bye-bye.